All right, so welcome to um, episode five of the Discourse Project. I'm joined uh, once again by Alan Lee. And um, welcome again, Alan, and thank you for joining me this week. Hey, Chad. Things are good? Uh, yeah, absolutely. How are you, Alan? Hope you had a, had a great week enjoying the uh, lovely uh, July weather, I hope. Absolutely. Actually, um, it's beautiful out here uh, in southern Alberta. I think it's I think Southern Alberta has the best weather in many of the places that I've been to in Canada. So I've taken full advantage of it. I've started a garden. I've been planting a lot of, uh, actually today I planted some seeds. It's my very first garden. I've, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I definitely have the fortunate luxury of uh, a mentor. So I'm getting a lot of knowledge and, and I've, I think I've put over at least a hundred hours into learning about growing food organically for the last week so that's what i've been up to and taking advantage of the beautiful weather here out here i think that's uh that's absolutely great you know uh it's something which i've tried several times myself i must admit i've never succeeded in growing anything except a small basket of potatoes um so i'm always really happy to see other people um succeeding at that um it's a great skill uh, hopefully in the future i can maybe you can share some of that uh information with me and uh you know, I think that it's something we should all be learning how to do. Absolutely. I think it's actually quite common for late millennials. I, uh, I don't know if you're still in that bracket, but, um, you know, anything, uh, anyone in their 30s and older nowadays, because we're stuck, we were tr stuck in that transition from, from, I guess, more of a trade skills uh, dominated industry towards a more uh, tech industry, I think a lot of us have forgotten um, the uh, gardening and, and and many other uh, things that things that were you know more hands on. Uh, that, actually, I found that gardening is actually very traditional and conventional. I think it's passed down from generation to generation. So if you, if my grandmother was with me here here in in town, she would have passed down those skills to my mother, and my mother would pass that down to me. I mean, my parents garden. But uh, I don't know if they were gardening in a way that made me feel interested. And a lot of it has to be with interest, right? If, if someone's doing it, and which is uh, something I really want to talk about later t uh, today, Chad, about um, leading by example versus leading by ideology. Something That's something I really want to um, pry your mind with as well. But uh, also, it's also interesting. You know, you call me by my first and last name, Alan Lee, and we do this show every week. Uh, what do you think about... You know, people with different different handles and, and online personas versus their real life personas before we even get into the crux of our discussion. Well, yeah, uh, it's a good question considering that I am somebody who consciously chose not to use my real name. I don't use my real first and last name um, in any context except when I'm formally applying to a job. Like at my job right now, for example, they do have my legal name but that's the only context in which i want that to get out and i have a number of pseudonyms which are difficult to keep up with um as you've known from um being uh on on facebook with me for six years now you know um i've i've gone from chad the persona of this channel uh, which many people think is simply my name, and that's all right. That's um, what my name is going to be when I publish my books later this year. I'll just have, you know, Chad as the, the pen name of those texts. Um, but, of course, I'm also Ronak, which was the Indian name that I, um, I uh, chose when I decided to, um, to whatever extent I am, um, Indianize uh, with uh, moving to India. I took the Indian name Ronak. And then, of course, I was Yusuf back in like 2015 when I had an Arabic name on um, on Facebook. Uh, so I have a number of pseudonyms, um, and that was intentional precisely because I don't want to go by my real name. And I, you know, definitely don't want to put pressure to be using your full name if you would prefer, you know, some sort of a, a screen name or whatever. You know, I always do uh, introduce the, the episodes with your name. But I mean, if you prefer something, I mean, I, of all people, would fully understand that. Oh, uh, no, no, actually, I, I don't mind at all. I just find that it is a very interesting time in our lives where identity is... Uh, an interesting discussion where because of our online presence and because how powerful the online presence and the internet is 
we've be, become, a, uh, you know, uh, adaptive to what people call us and what people identify us as. I mean, I, I, I logged probably three, 4,000 hours playing Starcraft when I was younger and I had a different handle. So, I mean, that, that like, you know, it's a video game, but some people might think like, oh, that's not part of your identity. But I mean, that's not, that, that was not even, a, um, you know, a, a, a game like World of Warcraft where people have gotten, uh, there's cases of people getting married on online. So um, it's a very fascinating topic of discussion. And I, I'm sorry to open that can of worms because that is going away from what we wanted to dis discuss about. But um, yeah, no, I don't mind you calling me Alan at all. And uh, I like the name Chad. It, I've, I've known you as Chad. <laughs> I, I call you Chad all the time. So Right, and Chad is, it's become who I really am because I was thinking about the difference between uh, being Chad online and who I was, even when I was in academia to the limited extent that I was, where, to be honest with you, I don't really feel like I affected anybody in that short run that I had, um, either as an adjunct or a TA or a grad student or whatever. Um, you know, I would present in graduate seminars with like five people in the room and nobody really, of course, cared after it was over, maybe not even while I was presenting, to be honest with you. And I feel like, um, you know, this difference between the me and um, the academy who really didn't accomplish anything, to be honest, I'm okay with saying that, versus what I've been able to do um, on YouTube, not so much what I've been able to do, but what I've been able to be a part of with building these connections. It's interesting, you know, in a lot of ways, the Chad uh, me is, is the real one, you know, because that's the one that I actually get to... Um, to do stuff with. And, you know, even having my face shown, we were talking just now about like reservations about, you know, letting your identity online be exposed. Um, I don't know. I don't think that you were watching in early 2012. My first videos were actually um, all made like this. Let me see if I can get it. Yeah, just like that. So um, the people who watched my videos say back in like April of 2012, all of the videos were like this. I wouldn't show the top half of my face. And I actually started to have people do videos in that style as something of a tribute or following after what I was doing. Um, so it was, it was really five months into the channel before I even started showing my face. And I don't really remember why I did that. Uh, but at, at any rate, you know, um, here we are, and um, I'm just happy to be a part of it. And, um, you know, I feel like it's a, it's a great opportunity, which wouldn't have even existed a generation ago. Like I talked with you on the first episode, I think about how something like this, I would have had to have been like on the local news in order to even do the type of dialogue that we're doing now that would actually be like televised. So it's it is a, a, a great privilege that we're able to do this. Yeah, it makes me think about, you know, how, how it's ironic that, you know, with 7 billion people on the planet that we are worried about what we say and how people can attribute certain things to us and that we find it necessary to hide our identity, um, especially when we talk about or have conversations like these or in, in, in any case uh, being shown online. Um, it, it just it's very it's it, it's just, it's. It's funny because uh, there's a lot of social red tape and I guess political red tape or even cultural red tape when it comes to talking about things openly, because as someone of a profession that uh, has a certain regard, like I, I teach for a living, um, if I was to come on the show and talk about certain things that might not align with the system or, you know, the institution's idea, ideologies, um, I could potentially lose my job. So again, I, I don't mean to keep throwing this back at you and making you go down these rabbit holes, but that's a, identity is a very interesting thing. Well, the main thing I think about with regard to um, the willingness of people to put out their real identity is, um, are you familiar with the genre called quitlet? No. What is that? Okay, so Quitlet is a genre of blog posts and articles uh, in, say, the Chronicle of Higher Education, in which uh, people who are adjuncts or uh, graduate students or even tenured professors in some cases publicly write pieces about why they found the path 
of the academic, um, you know, whether it be PhD or their job, whatever, so unbearable that they had to leave. And there are a few brave uh, voices out there who will use their real name, like William Panapacker, for example, although at the beginning he was uh, writing under a pseudonym, Thomas H. Benton, who was a figure from 19th century American history, because even at the beginning, he was not willing to um, put out his real identity. I think that maybe even they had to like do a search, like who is this mysterious guy writing these controversial pieces that go viral? And I think that they had to just track him down and find out that he was a guy named William Panpacker teaching in Michigan at an obscure school. Um, so there's a few guys who now he will talk with his real name, William Panpacker, but he's a, a voice in the wilderness um, compared to all of the... Um, people who are not willing to do what he does, but he's not unique in the sense of criticizing the system. In fact, the weird thing is if you go to a blog like 100 Reasons Not to Go to Grad School, which is published anonymously and has been for years, um, you'll find hundreds and hundreds of comments on every post that are almost all completely anonymous. So there's some blogs on the blogger format where you can leave a comment anonymously on a blog. You're probably familiar with this from using the service. And um, some blogs simply don't allow that because it opens the floodgates for like trolls and things like that. But a um, hundred reasons not to go to grad school um, uses it pretty, pretty much as default or by default because it's a, an environment, the academic environment is one in which people can only speak negatively on condition of complete anonymity. Let's just say you're a PhD candidate at some um, at some R1 institution or some Ivy League institution, and they can trace back what you really think about how suffocating the environment is to your name. It is something which when you go to try to find a tenure track position on the so-called academic job market is going to be a risk that none of them systemically are able to take. So it's one of those strange things as I used to follow this genre a lot that people will almost only criticize anonymously. I'm the exception to this because I say all of the things that they're really thinking every week here with my real face, not with my real name, of course. Um, but I'm willing to uh, go out there and say these things because I really have reached the point of of really not giving a shit anymore about um, finding any uh, a place within that system. I know that it's over and I get an enjoyment from getting to have the freedom most people could only dream of. But the thing is like most people in that system will only speak on condition of complete anonymity. And what really bothers me is the fact that when a piece comes out like by William Panapacker, um, grad school and the liberal arts just don't go. You have these counter pieces um, which uh, are always posted with a name. So it's one of those things where people only speak against the system on complete anonymity, but they only speak for the system with their real name. And the kind of counterpieces to that article went, th went something like, well, you know, I got a job, so he's just exaggerating, and I love my job, so there's nothing really wrong with the system. He's just making stuff up, because I can tell you, you know, big smile on my face, that everything's just fine. And it's like, do you really believe that? And um, are, why do you insist on having your face right uh, along with your testimony unless you're doing it to signal to your colleagues in the industry, hey, I'm not one of these troublemakers. Don't worry about me. I'm not a traitor. Here's my name and my face to prove it. Um, so it's one of those things. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed, maybe not only in the academic um, blogosphere, but just in general, that there is this sense in which whether somebody's willing to be anonymous or whether they're really willing to put their face and name there is built more on the ideological uh, rather than the truthful uh, content of, of what they're talking about, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I think what you're saying, and I'm trying to understand it, is that uh, institutions and systems get so big that it becomes a snowballing effect that you know, either you roll with them or you don't, uh, you know, but I've largely known you as an independent thinker, Chad. And I think that's one of your biggest strengths. It's, it's, you're, you're an objective thinker that sides with nobody. Like, I, I feel like your, your, your discussion on any topic, you spend enough time and effort arguing from both sides of the, I mean, you try your best at least, 
um, and it's unbiased, nonpartisan, and you try very hard. And what that's what makes you an independent thinker, and um, it's quite admirable. I don't know if you feel the same way about independent thinking and in that because when we associate ourselves with groups, uh, the red tapes start to come because you have all these things to balance. Um, and that's why I find that doing work uh, individually is always a, a lot more rewarding. Uh, then again, I find that there are lots of, uh, uh, anyway, um, but also I find that there's one way, uh, in order to combat uh, trolling, I think a lot of sites nowadays are using uh, accountability as a way to prevent people from uh, uh, doing so. So what happens is if you were to do a post on a certain news publication like the CBC, for example, you actually have to log in with credentials. And and the funny thing is you can use your Facebook to log in and that's a way for accountability. Uh, but meanwhile, you know, you can always make a fake Facebook uh, profile if you wanted to, but the sites, they've actually gotten pretty good at faking, like, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm spotting fake names. So if you have a, a totally, um, they would probably actually flag me as a fake name. It's like Chad Africa. Nobody's actually named that. Right. So they, and that's a good thing, right? No, absolutely. But again, that's very dismissive of all the work that you've done. Right. Like, um, if I was to spend some time on your channel, I could spend hours and hours looking at the content of this and the discussions that you've had, um, on the many topics of discussion that you've done and and that's discounted simply by your identity i don't think that's i don't think that's uh very effective well it's one of those things where um you can already receive a better education i will venture to say than i received in grad school so i'm not going to make that a universal claim but i will tell you from my own experience of going down that rabbit hole that um, I provide a better education on my channel for free than I got at graduate school at multiple institutions, which at least according to some ranking, and I did a whole video recently um, about why the academic ranking system is something you shouldn't even care about. You shouldn't even, by the way, waste your time looking up what the latest ranking system, where the rankings are. Um, but even if you go to a so-called highly ranked um, institution, um, you can simply learn more for free on my channel than I learned when I was in there. Oh, I believe it. And the funny thing is it's all for free. And I've come to realize that free things aren't what people want. People I tend to want to pay for things. Um, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. Like I find that like if you pay for something, you're tending, you're, you tend to be more uh, uh, active and because and, you're trading one thing for another, right? But whereas you're offering all this free content, a good content, that is better than some of the some of the uh, courses that are at universities that are pay that people are paying thousands of dollars for. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? Well, there's an inverse relation here between price and quality. Most things in life, that's not the case. Um, there was a joke of uh, Jeff Foxworthy talking about, um, you know, I saw an ad in the paper for cheapest LASIK surgery in town. Do you really want to brag about that? You know, like come meet me behind. <laughs> Dead, you know, bite on this uh, piece of cloth, give me the 20 bucks and we'll get it over with. Um, you know, most things in life, being the cheapest option is not a good thing, except in education. And I'll just give you one example, um, academic academic um, publications, okay? So you were uh, in college, probably used the library and noted that a lot of academic, like hardcover publications, monographs that are only available at the university library are actually not that good. They're not very readable. Many of them are very boring. And um, you'll be surprised to know that uh, the brand new price for most of them is something like $230. If you've ever actually looked for these works on Amazon, it would run you like 230 bucks for one book that you buy brand new. Whereas you could just go to, you know, the local used bookstore, like in my case, the Ark, which is basically like Goodwill. And you could get a book like this for 99 cents, which I guarantee you is going to be a lot more entertaining than whatever that book that you would, you could get 200 of those for the price of one of the academic books. So price is no indicator in the academy of quality. It e even more so with, um, with classes, uh, an academic, an academic book that's 200 
dollars um, is really nothing compared to the price of tuition. I don't know if it's as bad in Canada, but certainly in the United States, it's becoming the norm now to charge 50000 a year for tuition. It used to just be Ivy League universities, but now even the state schools who have no business charging that kind of uh, money um, are, are just joining the ranks, right? Oh, yeah. But, you know, back to the point that I was making, the snowball effect, um, you know, institutions have become so big that, you know, all of that money, all of that, uh, you know, extra money that they're charging uh, goes towards the facilitation of possible connections and networking. Whereas I, I, I feel like, you know, when they provide a facility like that and the experience, you know, it's a very abstract idea is that they're providing you an experience, a package deal that will allow you to be smarter and to be educated, that you can go get the college experience. You can pos you can, you can get everything from this, you know, th tens of thousands of dollars that you're putting into it. You're going to get this one little nice certificate that will prove to the world that you've done it. You've spent money on an education that you could have gotten for free, but you couldn't do it because you don't have the mental rigor to do it independently. And that's what you get. And some people will react to it actually the opposite way. Some employers will look at that decision as proof that you're, you know, not smart enough not to do it. Uh, I'm just quoting someone like Dave Ramsey, for example. He was making fun of a group of um, people protesting student loans who were holding signs around their neck saying, I'm $150,000 in debt. And by the way, I'm not agreeing with Dave Ramsey here because I know those people are the victims. But his reaction to that was, you're 150000 in debt for a bachelor's in psychology. That's like standing on the street with a sign saying, I weigh 800 pounds because I eat 10 cheeseburgers a day or whatever his joke was. And it's like, that's actually the reaction more and more that people in the independent world are, are having to somebody who's willing to spend or go into debt that amount. Which is a great way for us to segue into the actual topic that we're having, which is on uh, John Michael Greer's book, Retrotopia. Um, Chad, I think uh, your recommendation of this book is is uh, a great recommendation. I put it right on the top of my list to, to read. It's an easy and accessible book. And I'm going to give you a second to talk about it. Um, I, uh, I'll, I'll give you back the chance. I wanted to share like th this idea that, you know, um, it seems that we are moving to a point where we are giving way too much credit to ideology versus the trades. I mean, uh, something as simple as what I've been doing right now in my backyard, which is gardening. I'm a 30 year old educated in debt student. Now your typical student who's in debt or an ex student graduate alumni of a pretty good university in Canada. And I'm working now in a job that's quite stable. Um, but I don't know how to garden. Right. And do I say that someone, and then yet I'm learning from someone who's never gotten a, um, a post-secondary education who's got 30 years of experience of successful experience growing food um, you know tons and tons of food and I'm getting experience from this person and I can't get that anywhere else unless maybe I was to go to a specialist program where I'm paying thousands of dollars where I'm getting from someone who's doing that you know like it just it, it appears to me that we're getting to a point where um, we th how do you square that like I'm 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 learning from someone who's who doesn't have that certification, you know. Um, so which goes back to the book, and I I, I want to talk a little bit about that. So maybe you can share with the viewers and me um, what this book is about uh, in, in a quick summary. Uh, sure, and uh, two points, real quick. I want to respond yeah. to what you talk about with. Absolutely. Um, you know, having the education, but not having a really basic skill like growing food. And I'm right there too. You know, I've got uh, multiple degrees, at least in theory I do. Um, and I don't know how to um, grow a simple tomato plant. I, I did have a tomato plant once that got to be about this tall. And then it got swept away in a hailstorm, which are frequent in, um, in May in Colorado. It made it to the month of May, and then it got destroyed in the hail. And I never tried to grow tomatoes again after that. Um, so the question is, um, is your education at the university something which transfers over immediately to the kind of skills you need to live if the surrounding infrastructure um, has some kind of a problem. And I'm not talking about, you know, total breakdown. I just mean a simple problem with some sort of supply chains. And if you want concrete um, 
examples of that rather than just theory. Look at Greece in, say, the year 2011. I remember on the news they interviewed a guy in the streets of Athens who was um, totally homeless and just trying to beg for enough money to eat. And he said, you know, you wouldn't guess it, but I've got a master's degree from Cambridge University in England. There was a time where I felt pretty good about how smart I was or whatever within that institution, and yet I can't even scrounge up enough to eat right now. And it's a question, not that I'm, of course, making little of the very real suffering that went on and continues to go on in Greece, but it's just the idea of like, did he really learn anything at Cambridge, which is like supposedly best university in the world, one of them anyway, that would actually transfer into a skill that, um, you know, would actually help him when a serious problem happened with the supply chain of the world with regard to like, certainly money was a problem in Greece at that time, but also increasingly food. And that's something which the book is about. I think that if I can transition real quick to talking about the book, I think that reading uh, testimonies about the future in fiction is always a really interesting thing because no matter how diverse the um, stories might be, there's only really two ways that people think about the future. Um, Retrotopia is a third option. It's a legitimate alternative, but the only two ways that people normally think is apocalypse and utopia. So you're familiar with these options, either the utopia of technological infinite progress like the Jetsons, like in the future, everybody has robot slaves and nobody has to lift a finger for work, um, or the, um, uh, social progress of, oh, in the future, um, everybody's going to think exactly like me, no matter how they phrase it in euphemisms, that's really what the person speaking means, is in the future, everyone's going to become enlightened to think exactly like me. And it doesn't matter, by the way, if that person conservative, liberal, whatever, um, super religious, super anti-religious, it doesn't matter. The premise of in the future, it'll be perfect because everyone will be just like me is what they really think is going to, how they're really phrasing their vision of the future. But the, but the funny thing is that you also have these apocalyptic portrayals of the future, which I do like to read. Um, Oryx and Crake by Atwood, uh, Margaret Atwood is a very good and very disturbing um, testimony about a, a, a dystopian future. I'm actually writing a dystopian novel myself right now set in Oklahoma in the latter 21st century, um, which uh, I'll talk more about at another time um, once the book is actually written. But anyway, I like dystopian novels, but the thing that I, that thing that I always notice as being bizarre about them is to give you one very quick example of kind of a counterexample to Retrotopia is A Firestorm by David Class. Now, David Class is normally one of my best, uh, one of my favorite writers, and this is kind of his best known book. This is the main book that was his claim to fame, but I actually think it's his worst book. Um, no offense, David, if you're watching for some reason, but um, I, I, I don't like this book because it's set in, in um, a, a context in which a boy travels from a thousand years in the future to try to save the earth um, from ecological destruction by warning us, hey, I'm, I'm coming from a thousand years in the future and you've done so much environmental damage that life is no longer sustainable. And yet a thousand years in the future, they've got ray guns. And that's the bizarre way that even if you're writing a book specifically about environmental catastrophe destroying the earth, um, they still have ray guns. And that's the bizarre way that even if you're trying to envision um, the opposite of utopia, the opposite of progress, you're still stuck in the expectation that technology will keep progressing enough to where even in the dystopian future, they have more sophisticated weapons technology than we do today, right? Right. Um, in, the, in the novel, I've only gone uh, into it briefly, but it talks, uh, he does a really good job at framing the the view that he has when he's on a train. So the setting is that he gets on a train and he heads into a rural, uh, a, a different state, a completely different state, but known for its rural and pastoral and uh, sort of stuck in the past sort of uh, uh, present, uh, stuck in the past basically. And he's driving through and he sees all of the farms that are running on, uh, you know, uh, traditional and conventional tools. Uh, and outdated tools and he talks a little bit about scrolling through his you know his his technology and knowing that look uh, the the media portrays and typecasts this this state that he's he's 
going through to be outdated and archaic and uh, doomed because they're stuck in the past. But yet, yet, as he's on this train, he's looking out the window, his phone shuts off because his connection uh, gets cut off because there's no connection in that area. And so now he's stuck actually looking out the window and looking around his surroundings, which I think is very, uh, <laughs> um, I guess it's very similar to what we're in, in our present day where a lot of us are living on our phones. But anyway, he's looking through the window and he realizes that actually, um, these so-called archaic places, these places that are supposed to, supposedly going to fail because they don't have the machinery and the technology to, and and the and the uh, to to grow the food that is grow, happening outside of this 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 uh, area um, is um, is that actually they're quite successful and he's trying to make sense of it all. He's like, why is it possible? How is it possible that if people are still in these uh, doing this like supposedly um, outdated methods of agriculture they're still th they seem like they're thriving and that was really telling i don't know if you can elaborate on what i just said yeah i mean a couple points the first one is the irony is he's having this great experience uh, so in the story uh, oh. there is no united states anymore it's fragmented into several different countries and he's crossing the border from the f for the first time from the uh, territory that is basically like um, the Northeast right now, you know, New York City, Philadelphia. I'm not sure if exactly it's that area in the novel. But anyway, he's crossing the border to go to uh, what would be like the Great Lakes region now. He's going to Ohio through Pennsylvania. And it's legitimately a brand new experience for him. But what's he doing? He's on his phone. And it reminds me of um, when I was in India, I was on a safari boat um, on a lake um, in, in the jungle, actually. Um, and we were spotting like wild elephants and wild deer and things like that, which if you're like me, a guy from Southern Colorado, who's never seen wild elephants, that's a pretty fascinating new thing. And most of the tourists were from Europe. I could hear them speaking French and speaking uh, German and other things like that. Um, and we were on this safari boat and everybody had their phone out. And it's because they were trying to record or take pictures or whatever. And I'm like, I can understand wanting to take pictures of the elephants, but how is it that you can't even have a super vivid and real experience in India if you're from Europe or the United States without having it mediated by your phone? And it's one of those things where... Um, at least in that case, you're trying to mediate the experience. Most of the time when people have their phones out um, in, in just daily life in mundane settings, it's not to mediate what they're actually experiencing. It's to give them something else to experience. And that's what you don't find occurring in Retrotopia is he doesn't spend the whole novel on his smartphone trying to surf the meta net because um, the meta net doesn't exist in the Lakeland Republic. These are sort of artificial terms that he made up. The, there's no internet in Ohio, in other words. And that's the unthinkable future, which I guarantee you, you'll lose most people if you just right there, right? Yeah, and, and uh, later in the book, uh, uh, he, he bumps into a, a liaison in that, in that sp uh, the Republic and she, and he asks them, well, if you're not using meta, MetaNet and if you're not using technology to, to write your notes or type your notes, what are you using? And she goes, well, we use this technology called uh, pen and paper. <laughs> and I found that hilarious because like, you know, that's, it's so, and he, he's just mind blown. He's like, I can't believe it. You, you're, they're using, they're using uh, pen and paper to write their ideas down. But uh, to, to going back to your point about this technology that we use to see the world through, um, uh, there could be a possibility that we tend to use the cell phone or that medium as a way to compensate for our need for social interaction because when we take that picture how much of that picture is for ourselves and how much of that picture is for social media so that you get the acceptance and the likes of other people which is which is the most genius thing that I think a lot of these social media networks and and apps have done is that they've hijacked essentially the, the one of the one of the strongest I think um, human characteristics that uh, prevail of all of throughout humanity uh, civilization throughout history is is vanity is the idea that we want to be accepted by our friends 
And so technology has allowed this, this medium where we can take pictures and stuff has allowed us to connect with our friends so quickly and share moments uh, effectively. Um, and you get excited about that. And so it, what it does is it literally distorts how we had done it before the technological era, which was to maybe visit your house and say, hey, I just did something in storytelling. I mean, I, I, you quite honestly, if you walk into a junior high classroom, any typical junior high classroom, storytellers are few and far between. Like I can't, you can't really get kids nowadays to really talk about their experience uh, rather than them, you know, what I, I, I do notice is a lot of them take out their phones and before they describe their experience to me, they go, Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee here. here uh, what I'm trying to say is actually, look at this, look at this picture, you know, like, isn't that, isn't that strange, a phenomenon? It's worrying. It's, it's really worrying, um, quite frankly, because the older psychological theories marked storytelling as a basic skill in the development of a child. Um, if you studied like psychology, not that I'm a huge fan of that um, discipline, but there is empirical evidence to say that, as I recall, it's been like 10 years since I've taken this class, but um, it's about age five, I think, is where you, you see that milestone where the child goes from merely just blurting stuff out, I think, to actually narrativizing. And I think five years old is where the kid starts to realize that he can use, he or she can use stories to manipulate people, okay? Which, quite frankly, is a basic part of storytelling. And I don't mean manipulation only in a bad way. I also mean, you know, part of the reason Greer wrote Retrotopia was that stories do manipulate you to see things in a different way. They, they um, induce you to think of the world in different ways. That's why stories are valuable. And it was just a basic milestone in the psychological development of a child that at about age five, they realize, okay, stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. They have a problem and some tension building up, a, a climax, and then a solution. They have characters, they have setting. And these stories become uh, more and more sophisticated as they get older and older. And it seems that we've almost lost that because um, you don't really need stories anymore. You just need to pull out your phone. They called us the YouTube generation. Um, you and I, Alan, at age we're about 30. They called us the YouTube generation because the joke was that everybody's got a YouTube video. They got to pull out their phone and show somebody um, whether they want to see it or not. Um, but I think that, you know, we really are not even nearly as affected as it seems the um, the the younger generation has become because we got our smartphones like when I was 18. No, I was I had to have been more like uh, in my mid 20s when I had a smartphone. I had the uh, primitive cell phone at 18. I didn't get an iPhone until I was probably about 25 years old. Okay, so. <laughs> Chad, primitive as in like 10 years ago. You know what I mean? That's hilarious that the word, the way that you've used primitive, primitive, you know, in its context or in its, uh, you know, uh, dictionary, uh, if you were to define it, is. I would think like thousands and thousands of, year, of years ago, but technology has really changed the way that we look at that, isn't it? Isn't it it's fun? funny, isn't it? Because it was, it sure as hell was not considered <laughs> when it came out. And um, I was talking to a salesman at um, Verizon or AT&T uh, some years ago, and uh, I had this um, older uh, phone from like 2008, and it was starting to go out. And he said, look, I could get you another one like it, but you got to keep in mind when that came out, it was $400. So you have to understand that when it came out, it was considered cutting edge. So they simply invested much better resources into making that. Whereas the newer version of like a flip phone, if that's what it's called, is considered a cheap piece of crap. So they don't invest in it. And it's weird how, you know, like the, um, the, the, the older iPhones are starting to look pretty primitive too, right? And whereas that was super rich status symbol when it came out, right? I, I, can't, I can't help but think that cutting edge the term cutting edge parallels profit <laughs> like oh, of course, prop, yeah. prop and margins and, and, and yeah. Um, you know, I, I want to harken back to the conversation that, you know, the narrative, uh, the, uh, the character in Retrotopia and the liaison at the state uh, of the state, uh, when they have a conversation, he talks about like, he keeps thinking how things work in, in the Republic. And he goes, well, look, you know, so without meta, uh, uh, the, what is it? What is it called? The meta, the metanet. The it's metanet, the, that's right. Internet. You know, you and I can pretty much just use the same word. Right. Sorry. Yeah. So the intro without the metanet, the internet, um, how do people how do people find information? 
And she goes, well, there is a library five blocks down the road that you can have access to from your hotel and you can go there. And he goes, well, what about, I mean, isn't that very inconvenient? And she goes, well, there's far more important things than convenience. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that. I want to draw that point out a little bit. You know, this idea that, um, you know, what is the point of a library? What is the point of, of having to go outside of convenience to get certain things, um, you know, under the impression that technology has provided us all of this convenience, Chad, like this idea that if we have the internet and this access to everything at our fingertips, that this is overall going to be better for us. This is going to educate all of us. We're going to, it's going to make us have tremendous power and, 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 and do this. And that's the selling point. But I mean, uh, it doesn't seem that way. It doesn't seem that way. And in fact, if I log on to any form of the internet nowadays, I can, all I can see is, um, a very, a various forms of discontent and yelling and trolling and, and toxicity that, that is online. So, I mean, I want to draw the point out, uh, before I jump it, I give, uh, give it back to you is that, you know, this idea of going to the library, I mean, I, I do that quite a bit. I actually go to the library quite a bit and I actually take books out of the shelves and I do this. Um, but you know, it, it takes effort and it takes time and thinking and and there's a lot of things that takes you from your house to get you to the library to take a book out to find the reference to communicate with certain people to the librarian who i mean in many cases is and like this is archaic in so many people's minds that we don't leave the librarian anymore but i mean to having that conversation to the spark a conversation about what you're looking for all of those come and play into the narrative building that you were talking about earlier the foundational upbringing like the upbringing that certain kids have to experience to become a well-rounded human being that supersedes the convenience that the modern era of technology is trying to sell to us well the question is convenience at what cost because we never talk about cost i mean occasionally we'll talk about cost in dollar terms but we never talk about cost the cost in energy terms and just to give you one really really quick example um i mentioned last week that the 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 modern um you know agribusiness um PR person will say, well, we can grow three times more food. They don't tell you how they do that. They have to burn a hundred times more energy to get you three times more food. That's actually not a very good return on investment. That's actually more like uh, something that seems like bordering on insanity to get such a small return. And we um, actually have basically the same problem with almost everything else we do in that we spend exorbitant amounts of energy to get back either the same product or in many cases actually worse. I was reading um, about traditional woodworking today, the comparison um, in uh, this book of um, a lot of tools that simply don't even really exist anymore. Like even if you go to a, a tool shop, you won't be able to find them because they don't make them anymore. And they had all kinds of specialized woodworking tools for building um, carriages and for building um, uh, you know, ships and all kinds of different things that they used to build out of wood. And um, everything was pretty much replaced by machines. But the thing about machines is if, you, if you've if you used woodworking machines, they're very energy intensive. They're very expensive, like a thousand bucks for a, a, a table saw, for example. And they're really dangerous. Like you can legitimately lose, I don't know, like a good deal of your hand um, or worse, if you make a mistake with them. So, um, and they actually don't put out as good as stuff because a machine is only uh, manufactured to make a few select cuts, which are not based on what the craftsman decided he needed. It's based on what the engineer decided or the, uh, the executive at the business decided were going to be the couple cuts offered. So you actually get a worse product, an inferior product that consumes far more energy. And that's something of a microcosm for how we run all of society. Um, the internet is actually a very good example because you know we say that we need the internet to communicate information. And I realize the irony of me talking about this as somebody who has pretty much only the internet to spread information, um, because that's just the way the era we live in. Um, you and I right now are using the internet precisely for that. But we talk about like, you know, what will, what will happen to all this information if there's no internet to communicate it uh, in, in web pages or whatever? And the answer to that is, you know, books, 
right? Like libraries were the same function that we give to the internet now as centers of data that you can use basically without having to pay for it. So let's just say you need to look up a fact, but you don't want to spend a hundred bucks on some hardcover volume that you only need to look up one fact for. It would be inefficient if everybody had to buy every single reference. Um, that's why we have libraries um, to provide as a communal benefit to the whole community those sources of information with with no cost to the user except for taxes is actually an ingenious system and the only one that stands a chance of being sustainable i mean they had libraries hundreds of years and in one form or another thousands of years um and uh you know the internet really is not going to last that much longer as we know it um so that's that's the thing is like we spend so much more energy to operate the internet for in many ways getting inferior results because you can get shallow information on the internet and you may have encountered this part in the book too where he compares a newspaper that is detailed with uh the blurbs you get on twitter like oh here's a headline which most people won't even read there was a um a study about how most of the news articles shared on facebook and twitter people don't actually read the article they just see the headline and they jump and share it i would guess that most people who share the news articles don't read them either uh they just see the headline get excited and share especially if it promotes their ideal the, their ideology on a political level i mean i'm guilty of doing that too over the years uh, when i was more involved with social media um so it's one of those things where we have the illusion with the internet of vastly more information but we're actually getting vastly less information because what information we get is very shallow i've noticed myself that if i want deep information on a topic in philosophy i have to go to like a university library and get a um of a serious volume on the topic or i have to just purchase it if i can find it cheap enough because you can't just get it from what wikipedia right yeah no shallow information uh makes me think about what i was thinking about too is that you know the difference uh, uh to compare and contrast the idea uh, uh leading by uh sorry uh what's the word uh influence by ideology versus influence by example i mean on the internet like if you talk about rabbit holes like you know last night i was watching a lot of youtube videos of what you know what modern rap is and uh there is uh certain music videos that over have over 100 million views uh, and that's a highly influential music video you cannot deny that if that one of the top top hits on the internet right now is by artists who glorify violence and um you know the chase and the and and the, and and it's far deeper than that i think we can write a lot of papers about why people are drawn to vanity and shallowness and and in and consumption and it's great to just look on youtube right now the metrics don't lie man if this music video of a rapper who has a gun in his hand and uh yells about you know murdering and fighting other people and you know and how much money he has and has 100 million views that's undeniable that the metrics show that that is highly entertaining and highly consumed so leading by uh, that sort of example influence that influence of what i would call ideology is much easier to do whereas if you are to learn by example so i mean i'm going to talk a little bit about your experience as a blacksmith or someone who kind of delved into blacksmith work and um, pursuing that that was highly technical in, the, in a trade that requires intensive training on a very personal level there is no time for you to go on social media to express to people the the personal experience of you taking a hammer and bringing it down on hot metal that isn't something that you can do that's not something that you can you can put in a picture and share. It is an intensive personal experience. Now, intensive personal experiences are very rewarding, but it's not very easy to sell. You can't sell that to a kid. You can't sell that to me, Chad. Like, I don't, you're telling me that that is something I, I should be doing? Bringing a hammer down on hot metal? Like, that, that makes no sense to me, you know? Um, but yet it made a lot of sense to you, obviously, because you took the time to do that and you spent a considerable amount of hours to do it and similarly me growing food in the garden 
is highly invisible, but yet highly rewarding for myself. So to, to really think about it, the internet, what it does is it promotes it, it promotes ideology that is very easy to consume because it is shallow. And I'm going to make one more point about this before I uh, uh, take, too, take up too much time. But, um, you know, this idea that, look, in the institution, on the institutional level, we tend to spend a lot more time. Um, people who are articulate and spreading ide ideologies are are deeply rooted in ideology. They, they they consume ideology and then they they repackage it and they sell it and and it's used with words and linguistics to do it. Blacksmiths, uh, farmers, uh, tradesmen, uh, uh, and tradeswomen, and, and people who do things with with their hands don't have time to discuss this these these physical things and to write it in a book is going is going to be stored somewhere in a, in an archive somewhere where no one's going to take a look because if you are going to learn blacksmithing you're not going to learn it for, in a book chad you're gonna you're, you know what, you know what i mean oh absolutely i know what you mean because i tried to learn blacksmithing from a book and it is impossible um my own experience with blacksmithing was also that um you know you have to learn from someone who knows it because there's it's it's one of those things where the number of true craftsmen um, has shrunk so considerably that um, it's almost impossible to find one. Like, even if you can find someone claiming to offer a blacksmith class, like I found here in here in Denver, um, he was actually basically an amateur. I hope he's not watching, but um, he was not a real expert in the field. He was just offering like a, a couple fun hours on a Saturday afternoon for way too much money. But still, he was offering like a sort of shallow, like fun experience. He was not offering an apprenticeship at a serious level um, because he also knew that most people didn't need that. Most people weren't looking for that. Um, and the problem is there will come a time where we do need that again, right? <laughs> um, you know, you say that to the average person in the Silicon Valley, for example, they'll look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> Some parts of the country that should just be abandoned. I don't mean to offend anyone. I'm just saying that, like, I would never go to Wall Street and try to talk to people on the street on their way to um, their job as an investment banker or stockbroker and say, oh, excuse me, sir, do you have a minute of your time to try to discuss that? I wouldn't even waste my time. Um, and I'm not I'm not saying that they're bad people. I'm just saying that there's a, there's a very old saying that um, it, it's very hard to uh, get a man to understand a concept if his salary depends on him not understanding it, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that you're, you're getting paid hours. You're getting paid money to, yeah, that, that totally makes sense. Um, Chad, you know, you, your conversation about energy and, and how we, uh, certain people who sell to you that, you know, like, for example, the, the campaign to sell sustainability to us, right, to our generation, the idea of recycle, reduce, re renew, I mean, recycling, like, if you can go down those rabbit holes, the, the act of recycling, as the campaign sells us, is actually not really recycling. It's in fact, it's very low in terms of what it does for uh, then the ideology, the idea ideology of recycling may seem like you're being a very responsible citizenship citizen or you know leonardo talks about it leonardo DiCaprio talks about it in his film before the flood he talks about the idea that look uh, there was an era where everybody was to on oprah everyone said look change your light bulb and you're actually making a difference right um but really how much difference are you going to make like i mean my my friend daniel um dan boss he 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 had a he made a really off comment like he says very little and and to me, that it's resounding. But he said, like, he gave me my, my car battery died the other day, and I needed a charger. I needed someone, and I didn't even know how to charge my car for for God's sakes, because I'm useless. You know, I'm effectively useless, and I can't believe I'm a teacher when I can't even charge my own car. Right? This is this is how bad it's gotten. Where, and I've, I've come to realize that I've gotten a lot of holes to fill. And so, anyway, um, I hope I, I hope I could edit that. I, I don't want to get fired because I can't charge my damn car. But anyway, um, like. Um, uh, Dan goes like here. Here's the charger. You can go and he taught me how to charge my car. It was very simple. You know, he's he got this really. He has this really small charger and he put it in this bag. And the bag he gives to me and he goes, uh, you know, uh, this bag was. I've had this bag for 35 years. And and the first reaction I had, Chad, was like, oh, Dan. So uh, well, this bag must be really valuable to you. So I'll I'll make sure to return it to you. By the time I got home, I got thinking. That that that's not what he's saying. He doesn't give it. He doesn't care about the bag. He doesn't care if I lose it. He's saying that, look, I've used the same bag for 35 years. You talk about carbon footprint. You talk about 
you know, how much, how much sustainability, you talk about sustainable practices, you talk about all these people trying to sell you something so that you can be a little bit more sustainable. I've used this plastic bag or this cl cloth bag for 35 years. How, how, what about carbon footprint? What are you talking about for, you know, you, that's what I'm saying is that uh, if we really truly look at ourselves and our conspicuous consumption attitude, that hasn't really changed. Their people are just reinventing the same thing over and over again for us to constantly consume. Right. And the whole recycling thing in a lot of ways is more a status symbol. Unfortunately, it's devolved into that where if you have that recycling bin in front of your house on Wednesday morning when the, when the guy comes to pick up all your plastic bottles, it's more like people are putting it out there so their neighbors will see, oh, we have an ethical neighbor. Look, he's recycling or whatever, rather than taking into account how little difference it's actually making because like some people have noted that um they live so far out of town that um even having the recycling guy come to their house is actually wasting more energy to get there than they're getting back by recycling and rather than even questioning <laughs> the idea of why are we going through so many plastic bottles a week the thing that americans don't understand is in india there is no garbage service so one of the things that struck me um, when I first got to India was where's all the trash cans, you know, like there's plastic bottles all over the side of the road. And I asked my wife, I said, where's all the trash cans? She said, there are none because having daily garbage service is a luxury of the West in India, at least where I live, we, they don't have it. They get rid of garbage either by just throwing it on the side of the road where dogs come and eat out of it, unfortunately, or they have to burn it. Like um, fires on the side of the road are a common sight in India because that's the only way to get rid of all this stuff. And of course, that's not good for your health either, burning all that plastic. And the thing that nobody, especially in the West, will ask if for them it's just a matter of putting it in a can and a guy comes with a truck once a week and takes it all away is why don't we simply stop using especially so much plastic um, there are other ways to do things, by the way, um, jugs, right? I think uh, that's the point um, your friend was making. You know, you can have ways of doing things that don't simply go in the trash can after one use um, that are actually more sustainable. And that's ultimately what we're going to be forced to do, right? Back to the Retrotopia, Chad, um, there was a point that uh, he made, you know, he was like, he was driving through, he was on the train, he looked at these uh, farms uh, in, the, in the Republic and he's just like, well, not only are these farms not adopting new technologies and big, huge tractors systems that are potentially going to yield more crop, it seems like these these farms are smaller, small on smaller acreages on such smaller scale. Um, it, and he can't, he couldn't, he couldn't understand, you know, how they were successful and yet they were still very successful because um, what the media, outside of the Republic was saying was that, look, these, these guys are far less, they're, they're primitive in their, in their ways of approach, um, you know, but yet they're self-sustainable. Like it, it brings me to the point, like, you know, the way that we are growing in itself is very unsustainable is it's the idea that, look, if you kept it small and you didn't have so much to be so inundated with things that potentially you could, you could be doing, um, a lot more sustainable things. Like, I mean, um, you know, if I didn't buy so much stuff, if I was using the same material over and over again, that's the ultimate form of sustainability, no? Right. And there's this idea also that the more efficient a system becomes, the more brittle it becomes. Um, huh. You know, the idea of, well, obviously it's most efficient to have thousands of acres of farmland growing only one um, genetically modified soybean managed or whatever by one corporation instead of family farmers driving tractors over all that and bringing down literally plain loads of pesticide to dump on them. That's pretty efficient. Uh, it's extremely brittle because if one thing goes wrong in that equation, you have, you know, a lot of people going hungry, whether it's the, um, the, the seeds I've mentioned before that the, uh, the seeds are really going to be the apocalyptic thing. And I don't want to spoil the plot, but, mm -hmm. um, later on in the novel, GMOs play a huge role in some of the decline of America. Okay. I'll leave it in vague terms like that, but certainly I think that that's prophetic. That is going to play a huge role in some kind of catastrophe in our not too distant future. Um, having, the seeds that feed your population come from basically a factory where they're not even real seeds. 
their genetically modified patent um, intellectual property um, is very dangerous because uh, a, a super efficient system where everything is concentrated in one entity is very brittle. If one thing goes wrong, the system goes down. The point I think that we can um, maybe get from the idea of many small farms is it's not nearly as efficient, but it's also much less brittle because if something goes wrong with one farm out of a hundred, you have the other 99 still functioning. And when you mention brittle, it has an effect on it economic, on the ec economics of, 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 of the matter, but it also has an effect on the cultural fabric of small farming traditions, because what's happening is that these systems, according to the book, is that, you know, the, the, the influence and the, the, the aggression of the government and systems essentially tries to pry and destroy the fundamentals of what small farming practices are. Like, I mean, harken back to 50, 60 years ago, the, the average American farmer, um, you know, there were far more American farmers with 6 million uh, different farms in, in America. Uh, now it's only, you know, it's dwindled down to 3 million by half and a majority of it's owned by corporations. I mean, what happened to the fabric of the family? You know, it just appears that, you know, here's a good example, Chad. I mean, uh, this idea that, look, uh, if we, uh, the education system and the the political ideology is that, look, kids should not be working at an early age. In fact, it would be considered child labor. And there are many cases of this. There's a lot of cases of child labor, um, Nike, for example, huge corporations taking advantage of, of the disadvantaged and marginalized and using them to uh, to create products that we can buy for uh, higher prices now let me ask what about the farmers and the farming back practices of of, of the traditional farmers where uh kids were kids were farming at earlier ages at 12 13 and helping up on the farm and now the government says look you're not allowed to do that because it is you're 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 effectively child you're using kids as child labor right um it, there's there seems to be a destruction of family values because of that and it's an encroachment of government practices and policies right. right and the idea of childhood is kind of a romantic era concept if i'm not mistaken um you know if you take a course on the romantic era they'll say and you know all this obsession with childhood in wordsworth was kind of a romantic invention you didn't have childhood is this idyllic time where you don't have to do any work your only job as a child is to enjoy life because that's your only chance to do so that's why you look back nostalgically when you're an adult and you have to work but that's really a romantic concept before then as soon as you were old enough to work you 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 were and people i know who grew up in so-called third world contexts uh, before so-called modernization said it, it, it it's been that way when you're old enough you go to the rice farm the rice paddy and you start working as soon as you're old enough for you 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 tend to go to whatever the particular job is and you know we might lament that the modern enlightened person or whatever might say oh you're uh, encroaching on um that person's um uh i don't know psychological well-being by making them work but i think that that's a dysfunctional and distorted relation we have to work which we have the ability the privilege to relate to work that way right now only because we live at a very strange time in history we won't have that ability much longer. The idea that work is a, uh, a disturbance of your psychological well-being. It's unreasonable to ask you to work. Um, really, for most of history, you just work, you know what I mean? And I think that the modern um, obsession with, uh, you know, like the, uh, the, the grad student of, oh, I'll never be happy if I'm not uh, teaching as a professor, which is why so many of them fall, unfortunately, into depression when it doesn't happen, is something I've never really understood personally, because I've spent my whole life working very hard with my hands, and I've never really expected that it should be any different. And in fact, I was always happier when I was doing so. It wasn't an, an, a, a, a disruption of my of my happiness. It was really a path for me to feel like I was being happy or productive or whatever. And I think that some of the alienation we see in the West right now, especially with the youth, is precisely from maybe a lack of really having to work on anything, right? It's a generation rendered useless. I mean, we're 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 becoming. I mean, based on the book and what he's suggesting, suggesting and leading, 
towards is that, look, we've become so far removed from what makes us humans and a self-sufficiency that, uh, you know, at, 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 at any given time, a, a dystopic future that he's trying to paint um, could po potentially, you know, be the end of an entire generation of uh, of people rendered useless. I mean, it's I, I am the biggest proponent of technology. I mean, I've, I've grown up on technology. Technology has made me who I am. You know, but then if I was to take a step back and not to navel gaze and to, and to constantly try and tell everyone that I'm great because I use technology, I can type on a keyboard without looking, I can I can navigate and I can set up my computer and I have all these things. Take a step back and say, can I use a, a hammer properly and build something? Can I can I visualize and build something and 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 grow some food? Like if I can't if I can't admit that, and which is which is a which is a big thing. I mean, I think uh, ego. Take, I mean, I would love for you to give me a brief understanding of how the ego works, but you know, my ego will try to tell me not to admit that I have a lot of faults and gaps in my understanding of the world and its and its surroundings. Right, because the ego is in a lot of ways culturally conditioned to uh, want to be a certain way. I mean, you talk about uh, leading by example rather than leading by ideology. I think that that's something which these days a lot of people are losing track of the basic common sense, which goes all the way back to monkeys, if you think about it, that monkeys, they call it aping. If you uh, see somebody do something and then you do it because apes do that too. Uh, it's not even necessarily a human thing. It's a, it's a primate thing actually um, that you do things because you see somebody else I guess, doing it and enjoying it, and then you decide to do it. Um, to be honest with you, a lot of what attracted me to woodworking was watching even just maybe on YouTube, the enjoyment that some people get out of it. I mean, it's not um, the kind of thing which is so much tolerated as a way to make money, like so many of the jobs these days that people really dread, but they do it just because they have to. Um, even good paying jobs like... Um, I won't say too much about it, but I have a uh, I, I'm, I know somebody um, close who uh, recently lost a job that paid over a hundred thousand a year um, in the in the oil industry, and he actually feels okay about it because he didn't like the job. So I mean, it's one of those things where, in the short term, it makes sense to tolerate something you despise for the money, but over the long term, it's unsustainable and. The way that you'll get people to do things in the long term is to make them feel like they're going to get something out of it. The short term idea of, oh, we'll just pay you off with enough money or we'll intimidate you. And I think a lot of, um, you know, as controversial as this will sound, I was reading John Michael Greer's blog this morning about how some on the left, not all of them, obviously, but how some on the left have reacted since Donald Trump won with uh, rather than saying, to the, the so-called Trump voter, let's talk, why did you do what you did, rather to double down on denouncing them as pure evil and saying there is no compromise because nobody voted for Trump except out of pure evil. So they just, they just have to be forced to do things the way we want. Um, as some have said, you know, Trump shouldn't be able to appoint a Supreme Court justice to replace Anthony Kennedy. Although clearly the rules of the game are if you won the presidency, and you won the Senate, which his party did for better or worse in 2016, you have the right to appoint the Supreme Court justice. There's a, there's some, not all, on the far left who are saying, no, that rule needs to be suspended because Trump is pure evil. And they're not going to um, uh, be able to convince anyone with that argument because humans ultimately don't work with being forced to do things, even if you legitimately believe that your perspective is morally the right one at the level of content. I'm not passing judgment right now whether it is or isn't. That's not the point. The point is that anthropologically speaking, people don't work at the level of being forced to do something. They work at the level of meeting them as basically primates who have to be um, interacted with at the level of giving them a reason to want to do something. And there's no better motivation for that really than giving them something that they can want to be themselves. A lot of, um, you know, ra there was a rationalist like PhD in physics who became a Christian and his testimony was, it had nothing to do with the arguments on rational grounds. I had enough of those from physics. It was just 
knowing the people and seeing like, oh, these are pleasant people to be around or they, they seem happy. That's the reason I, I decided to become a Christian. And I'm not I'm not passing judgment once again on the content of his decision. I'm just saying that the reason he did it was because he wanted to be like the people he knew, not because they were telling him that the content was something he had to accept, right? How dare you want to choose to be a better person? <laughs> um, I mean, be happy. Right. Yeah, or be happy. You know, how dare he? Um, you know, but I, I wanted to ask you a question, Chad. Um, you know, it seems like you do not come from a family of. I, I, I'm not. I, I'm not sure about this, but if if whether or not you came from a family that has passed on the trade skills of blacksmithing and woodworking, and some of these trades that you've dabbled in, uh, does your family have traditions in that field? Well, all four of my grandparents were farmers. Um, my grandfather was a uh, native speaker of German in Amish country. I don't believe he was Amish ethnically, but certainly that was the part of Pennsylvania he lived in. And, uh, you know, he really did grow up in the Great Depression when farming wasn't just like a, a fun thing you did. Like so many people, not you, of course, but so many people who dabble like in hippie farming these days are doing it just because it looks cool. But of course, they still get all their food at the grocery store because it's just like a hobby for them. For him in the Great Depression in Amish country, it was um, more like a duty, right? Um, right. That you, the part of life that you did out right. of your duty to feed the community. Um, and my grandmother basically was the same um, background in um, uh, she, her ancestors were really from Quebec, but I think they crossed the oh. border in Vermont. Uh, so they're actually French Canadian, but I think she lives right on the border of Vermont. Um, and then my other grandparents were uh, rice farmers in South Korea after the Korean War, um, living in, you know, mud huts, uh, rice paddies, um, all of that sort of thing. Um, and the thing is, like, when I talked to my grandmother about farming, she was very skeptical, even though that was her way of life as a child. She was skeptical about whether it could work in modernity. So that's the problem is even the people for whom that was simply the way of life when they were young, I think that if you give them the choice of asking whether it's even worth preserving these skills now, I think that many of them will react by saying that was just the past. So I think that all too often, these skills were not always just taken away from us. A lot of us, I think, maybe willingly gave them up because we were convinced that, well, they have no future anyway, although in the not too distant future, um, they'll have to be brought back by, not even by choice, just out of necessity, right? Yeah, and it's interesting that even though they are farmers, that even when you dabbled in in woodworking and the experience that you got, that you were exposed to woodworking through, I guess, YouTube videos and stuff. Um, you know, it, it is really cool that we 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 try these things. That that you know, uh, someone who does come from a academic background, that you decided that look, even though I do not have those skills growing up, and even though I had generations where those skills were not passed down to me that I'm willing to step out of my comfort zone and try something completely new. And, and that is a very admirable approach to the world right now is that I think a lot of us need to spend some time contemplating or reflecting on what can potentially give us um, the ability to be self-sustainable. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, whether they're actually following through with action or not are, getting attracted to the possibility of it because like so many people in the United States, probably in Canada too, who are not in on the, the industries that are, that are still giving them um, a, an existence that's comfortable, which in the United States is, I don't know, it's well over half, even though we don't talk about it. Um, a lot of people, if you're not in on say the oil industry or the finance industry or something like that, um, you're struggling. And um huh. You know, a lot of people, I think, have become discontent, so discontent with business as usual that even if it's only at the level of fantasy, they want to at least see, maybe just on their smartphone on YouTube, what would it look like to do it a different way? Absolutely. That's why videos on blacksmithing, videos on um, on uh, farmsteading and keeping chickens and keeping goats, they Absolutely. get hundreds of thousands of views. I Absolutely. don't think that everybody who watches the video on how to milk a goat um, is actually gonna go out and do that. Most of them won't, but there's still considerable numbers of people who are at least 
looking for it on YouTube, which means a lot of people are starting to um, really legitimately wonder what would it be like not to have to live the way that I, I am right now, completely hostage to all of the market systems and to my paycheck, which one way or another gets smaller every year, right? Absolutely. Um, well, Chad, I think uh, this conversation has definitely gone over the hour that we usually do. Um, and I, I feel like I could talk to you this for another couple of hours. Um, uh, I think we should end it here. And um, maybe, I don't know, have you been paying attention to the chat? Has there been people jumping in on the chat and kind of commenting at all? I checked it a couple times. I didn't see anything, uh, okay. but I did check it a couple times. I can check again right now if you want, but... Yeah. Uh, I think no, absolutely. it's not a big deal. I just think that uh, uh, there's a lot of points that we make in that because people generally don't have the time and the capacity to go through all of these uh, uh, to stick with us the whole time. And and rightly so. I think everybody has a lot of things to do in their lives. I think what, what I'll try to do is I'm going to try and edit. And I said that last week with you. I just haven't had the time to go around it. But I'm going to edit some key points that we've discussed over the last couple of episodes. And I'm going to upload it onto... Um, into a video format and I'll send it to you. And depending on whether you want to post that or if I want to post that, we can at least post some um, key key points that we've talked about within the hour time frame and, and use that as a way to generate some more interest. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I appreciate uh, you um, suggesting that. And cool. uh, certainly um, thank you for joining me next week. Maybe we can read some more of Retrotopia talk about it. I feel like even though we did talk for over an hour, I feel like in a lot of ways, um, I at least never actually addressed the central concept of the book, which is that on the on the one hand, people see apocalypse. On the other hand, people see um, infinite progress on technological grounds. What about um, just going back to what we did a um, hundred years ago, which is unthinkable to most people. Oh, it could never be that. But mm -hmm. actually, that's the most likely future we have. And that's why I think this book is a great thing for us to talk about. So maybe we'll read a little more of it. Wow. And yeah. Just, yeah. That, that, that blows my mind in itself <laughs> to be, to be living like we did a hundred years ago, but yet equipped and capable of having conversations and discussions of everything that's happened in between is, is very powerful. Yeah, and it's also the idea that, you know, when we talk about going back in, in, in time to the way we used to do things, people automatically assume it's going to be squalor and misery. Part of the point of the book was to show that, you know, people can live not perfect, obviously, um, as some utopian futures promise, but but normal lives, you know, they they fall in love, they make friendships, they enjoy parts of their daily routine, they build relations, all of the normal things in life are not going to be lost if we lose the internet. Well, thanks for the discussion again. Great hanging out with you, Chad. Uh, uh, I appreciate your time. Absolutely. And thank you once again for joining. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to the next time we get to talk. All right, man. Cheers, man. All right. Take care. And see you the next time.